Happy 4th of July, and this week we explore the legacy of Thomas Jefferson. Hello, friends. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and welcome to We the People, a weekly show of constitutional debate. The National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. In a National Constitution Center conversation a few months ago, Professor Akhil Amar of Yale Law School announced his intention to break up with Thomas Jefferson. And in this episode of We the People, we explore why he's decided to break up with Jefferson and what aspects of Jefferson's legacy deserve defense. We're honored to be joined not only by uh, Professor Amar, but by one of the leading Jefferson scholars in America, Professor Peter Anoff. And it was so wonderful to convene both of them today. Akhil, welcome back to We the People. Thanks for having me, Jeff. And Peter Anoff is Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor Emeritus in the Corcoran Department of History at the University of Virginia. And Peter, it's a wonderful to welcome you to We the People. Yes, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Akhil, in your appearance at the NCC and in a forthcoming essay, uh, which will be published soon in the National Review, you argue that you've decided to break up with Jefferson and you uh, emphasize that his constitutional legacy, in particular his vision of states' rights versus national power and strict construction versus uh, broad construction of the Constitution, as well as his legacy on slavery, have persuaded this, uh, you to announce this dramatic breakup. Tell us more about what Jefferson's constitutional legacy is and why you've decided to break up with him. And I think the metaphor of breaking up is, is heartfelt for me because I did grow up kind of in love with the guy. Um, and I think, Jeff, I, uh, I mentioned, and this is true, that when I was a, a young man, I, I, I think I kind of dreamed about if I ever had a son one day, I was going to, with my spouse's permission, of course, um, I was going to name my son Jefferson. Because uh, there's a lot uh, to admire. And before I identify the, 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 the causes which impel a separation. And in the Declaration of Independence, there's actually a very emotional passage about um, uh, in which um, Jefferson, writing for America, um, announces that we're breaking up with our brethren, with the British people, and not just with our king, our, our father figure. Um, and, and, it, and it is very emotional, you know, a, a breakup, a dissolution. Um, and so... Um, I grow up admiring Jefferson as the poet of the American Revolution, as a dreamer um, of a better world, as someone who believes in rights and who insists that there be a Bill of Rights. Um, um, he, he maybe uniquely insists that there be a, right, a Bill of Rights even before Madison has seen the light and at a time when most of the others at Philadelphia actually had not paid much attention to this issue. They wanted to get out of town. Even before that, Jefferson had championed religious uh, freedom in particular, a bill of religious freedom um, in, in Virginia in the 1780s. Um, he would later push back against a federal oppression with the Sedition Act of 1798 as part of the Virginia and Kentucky Resolves. As a, a young man, he um, uh, is dreaming of ways to limit slavery. He's the architect. He, uh, you might even say he's the original author of what will become the Wilmot Proviso, an idea that, that there should be no slavery in the West. He believes in a certain vision of, of democracy and, and uh, is a passionate uh, advocate of uh, decency and good sense of ordinary common people. Um, he's a champion of, of education. As president, he will double the size of the United States so with the Louisiana Purchase. So there's a lot there to, to genuinely ad admire. Um, now, the breakup is basically all about especially slavery. And I think he gets worse on slavery as time goes on. And we might want to talk about that. Um, I think he has too exuberant a sense of states' rights. Um, he plays footsie 
with ideas of nullification and even um, he, sort of secession. Um, he sort of smiles upon that um, uh, too much for for my taste. But but slavery is the big one, and and uh, and and in particular, uh, Jeff, it's personal for me. It's personal for him. He 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 enslaves his own children. Um, and, 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 and we didn't, I didn't know that the, we, the world didn't know that, um, 30 years ago, quite, we didn't have the DNA evidence. And, and for me, that's one of the causes that has impelled my declaration of independence from Jefferson, so to speak. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Peter Anuf, uh, Akil Amar has identified aspects of Jefferson's legacy that deserve uh, veneration, including his championship of a Bill of Rights and the Virginia Bill of Religious Freedom and pushing back on the Sedition Act, as well as his vision of democracy uh, and his faith in common people, but has said that because of his um, playing uh, too exuberant a sense of states' rights with nullification and secession, and in particular his position on slavery, Akil has decided to break up with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, would would you are, are you prepared to break up with Jefferson, or would you like to uh, remain allied with him? Well, uh, Jeff, uh, I appreciate Akil's dilemma, but I never got that close to Jefferson, even though I've studied him for a long, long time. He's an interesting and engaging character, and I think it behooves us as Americans to understand him the world he lived in and what he imagined our future might be. And on the issue of slavery, I just want to make a simple argument, and I think, uh, I hope Akil finds this compelling, and that is we need to know more about Jefferson as he's writing the Declaration, what his background is, and he is a Creole Virginian, a provincial who sees that slavery is an evil. This is a new understanding in the enlightened Atlantic world. The slavery is a bad thing. It's an injustice. Jefferson believes this and wants to do something about it in Virginia. But what Jefferson understands, and this comes clear, I think, in the passage in the Declaration of Independence that's so easy to make fun of when he blames George III for slavery, when of course it's Jefferson's fault and the fault of slave owners who are exploiting human beings. There's no question about that. But what Jefferson is really communicating is a great disappointment, and that is slavery is an imperial problem. It's not just an American problem. It's a British problem. It's an English problem. It's a problem of creditors and politicians in Britain, as well as privileged planters in the New World. You have to put Jefferson in that imperial Atlantic context. And the, the great tragedy of the Declaration, of course it announces these principles that we hold dear and should, but it also marks the end of any hope for an imperial end to slavery. The institution of slavery was supported by British capital, by British consumers, by British politicians, and Americans were cogs in a larger machine. They wanted to take the lead. They, they recognized the evil because they lived with it and in it. And anti-slavery activity begins in British America. But it becomes a great indictment of the American project. And the reason for that is what's left after independence of the old British Empire is a set of colonies that are heavily dependent on slavery and for whom union, a more perfect union, is absolutely essential to secure independence. Patriots in America did not want to break away from the British Empire. It was with great reluctance they did so. And that's because they saw that the great British Empire expanding to the West in the wake of the victories of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, would be a great empire of liberty. Instead, the tragedy of the Declaration is that though the United States would achieve and actually win independence, it would be as a in a union 
committed to the principle of slavery, of because there would be no union without slavery. That's the tragedy. And it's that question of scale and scope that I want to emphasize to Akil. He talked about how uh, Jefferson went downhill on slavery, started off well, didn't end up well. Well, I wish he hadn't been involved in the Missouri controversy either. But the sad thing about American independence is it made it created the conditions for an independent empire of slavery. Akil, tell us more about why you believe that Jefferson got worse on slavery, beginning with his attempt to blame the uh, king for it in the Declaration and ending with his endorsement of diffusion, secession, and uh, a pro-slavery national party, the Democratic-Republican Party. So... I think what Peter said is very compelling. It puts things in context. Um, and you're asking me then, so what went wrong with Jefferson? Why, how, why did he go downhill, go south, so to speak? Truthfully, I do think um, some of these issues are issues of character. And Peter began by saying correctly that slavery and the slave trade were imperial policies supported by the British king, a British parliament, a British board of trade, a British system, British aristocracy. And I think one person who in forthcoming work will really um, show that very powerfully is a, a scholar named Holly Brewer. So the Brits bear a lot of responsibility, but Peter also said Jefferson is too quick to deflect all moral responsibility onto the Brits when, of course, he and his fellow Virginians and other um, Americans in what will become ultimately the southern states bear a lot of individual culpability. Um, they made choices. They had agency. They chose to boycott tea, um, but they didn't choose to abandon slavery. Um, and and uh, and Jefferson doesn't even at the end, even privately see at the end of his life he doesn't free his slaves because he's buying uh, wine and and chasing um, women and and engaging in uh, I guess uh, song would be music uh, for wine women and song so so and that's a moral weakness yes Washington scrimps and saves and um and and pit, uh, so that he can free his slaves at the end of his life and Jefferson doesn't you see. And this passage that gets cut out of the Declaration of Independence, blaming the Brits for all of that, he's letting himself off the hook way too easily. He's not a New England Puritan, you know, who would be more self-critical. Um, and it's not the Brits who are forcing him at the end, you know, later to enslave his own children and, and deny that he's doing that. That's, that's him. And as time goes on, I do think he gets worse on this. He, he starts out saying we shouldn't spread slavery to the West. And as Peter and Jeff, you have reminded us, by the end of his life, he is pushing the idea of spreading slavery into the West, diffusing slavery, which will be the policy of Dred Scott, that you have to expand slavery into the West. And this begins with Jefferson and Madison on the Missouri Compromise, repudiating the early Jefferson idea um, which will be Lincoln's idea, read my lips, no new slavery. Let's stop it from spreading. That's going to be Lincoln's mantra. And he's building on the early Jefferson, who actually authors an early version of the Northwest Ordinance saying no new slavery in the West. So that's the early Jefferson, and he gets worse on that. So it reminds me of a Jackson Brown song called The Pretender. Are you there? Say a prayer for the pretender who started out so young and strong only to surrender. He starts out a dreamer, but in part because there is a character flaw. He lets himself off the hook too easily, and um, he builds a, pro, a, a party. He needs to for liberty in part because John Adams is making a crime to criticize John Adams when John Adams is president. And Jefferson needs to stop that, and he builds a political party to stop suppression, and, and that's the Virginian Kentucky Resolves, and that's his party. But once he builds that party, and it's a, it's a party with a Southern base, he doesn't want to give it up, and, and he goes with his party increasingly as time goes on. If he were alive today, he would not be Liz Cheney, 
he would be Kevin McCarthy. He's a politician of a certain sort, and he goes with his party, and he starts to compromise his principles in a certain way. And Peter said one other thing that's, I think, really important, that the American Revolution, even though Jefferson um, is a complicated character and in the end um, will um, not free his slaves, um, the American Revolution is not a pro-slavery revolution, as some have been taught in the 1619 Project. Um, Peter put it, well, actually, the American Revolution immediately gives rise to abolitionist ideas, not just to freeing slaves, but ending slavery. The world's first abolition society is, um, is from the world's first in Philadelphia in 1775. And its um, presidents are going to eventually be people like Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Rush, who signed the Declaration of Independence. Very soon, and, and it's Jefferson's declaration in part, but it's also Franklin's and, and Adams's. And Franklin's and Adams's um, states, now that they're independent, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, are going to end slavery very soon after the Declaration of Independence in state constitutional language and then in Pennsylvania's case, statutory language, saying all men are born, all persons are born free and equal. And that language in the Massachusetts Constitution, building on the Declaration of Independence, will lead to abolition in Massachusetts. And Pennsylvania's Constitution has similar language, and Pennsylvania is going to have a statute in 1780 um, ending uh, slavery on a gradual basis. So immediately after breaking with the Brits, actually, many of the states that we call the North uh, today, um, and basically north of the Mason-Dixon line between Pennsylvania and Maryland, many of these states rather immediately take steps to end slavery. Um, the Deep South doesn't do that. Virginia's caught in between, and, and the great Virginians like Jefferson and Washington and Madison um, at the time of the Revolution um, basically understand that slavery is a bad thing and that it, it should be eliminated. Washington continues to actually believe that with increasing intensity and uh, conviction and he does something about it. At the end of his life, he frees his own slaves, and, and Jefferson doesn't. Instead, Jefferson enslaves his own children. A, a, a few of them are freed, of course, the, the, the Hemingses, but not any of the others in, in, in general. And, and that's the tragedy of Jefferson. Um, because he knows it's wrong, um, but he is, I think, too easy on himself. He is weak-willed. Um, and, and he's a spendthrift and he's spending his money on wine, women, and song rather than scrimping and saving, uh, so that he can free his slaves on his deathbed, which he, to repeat, he does not do. And Washington does do. All right. Well, let's turn from the question of slavery to the question of states' rights. Uh, Peter Akeel has said that Jefferson's response to the Sedition Act of, of the Federalist Congress which he attacked on grounds of states' rights, led to the founding of the Republican Party on the principle of, of states' rights versus national power. And this uh, uh, increasingly led to arguments for secession and nullification. Uh, tell us about Jefferson's vision of states' rights versus national power and whether or not you agree with Akil that it uh, is not to his credit. Well, there's no question that Jefferson has different standards for free speech, uh, and the politics of the day, we have to remember, were vicious. And uh, the possibility of a polarized American people falling apart was a live one in the 1790s. Just as I've argued that we need to keep geopolitics in mind when we think about the slavery problem and what a problem it was, in a, the political economy of a new nation that depended heavily on the institution and would continue to do so throughout its existence until the Civil War. We also need to think about the way actors in the 1790s and the emergence of the party system, if you could call it that, and Akhil is quite right, Jefferson is a partisan, but he's an anti-partisan partisan who believes that the Republican Party does represent the American people. And the American people's greatest legacy, what needed to be defended, was against the resurgence of monarchy and aristocracy, hierarchy, that fear 
that maybe Anglo-Americans were not all that different from Britons in the mother country, that there is something about them and maybe about human beings generally that's going to lead to uh, the emergence of a powerful state and a monarchy and so forth. And that struggle, which became an international struggle in the context of the French Revolution, nearly divided and destroyed the Union. And we have to keep in mind that because of slavery, that Union was destroyed eventually. What I'd like to say here, though, Jeff, right now on, on sedition and, uh, and on his politics more generally, is that the, the issue for Jefferson is to preserve the Union, to sustain the American people in a dangerous world. That requires mobilization. It is bringing people together, making them active. And this is what we remember Jefferson for. As a, the mobilization of the people in the context of the party battles of the 1790s to avoid returning into the orbit of the British Empire and to maintain American independence was the all-important thing. What I'd like to emphasize, though, is that the binary opposition of state and nation is anachronistic. Just because Jefferson was an advocate of the Republic or Commonwealth of Virginia and its interests didn't mean that he was not a nationalist at the same time. These are not incompatible things in his conception of federalism. That is, the Constitution itself, and I would emphasize to Akil that the great achievement of the Constitution was to create a peace plan for the former provinces of the British Empire in North America to create a, a pact or a plan, a treaty organization, a more perfect union that would eliminate the possibility of war. And this is part of the pathos of the Constitution, and you can feel it acutely there at the Constitution Center, is the whole point of it was to maintain peace, and it didn't. And that peace nearly fell apart on several occasions until it finally did in the Civil War. In some ways, uh, to, to talk about party conflict as if they're the parties that, well, we used to know in America, I don't know what they are now, and that, uh, that somehow uh, there was no larger issue of the survival of the Union that there was no larger threat to the Union. Americans needed to keep the peace at home if there was to be an America. They needed a plan to do that. And keep this in mind, too, that when we talk about union, it is a union of the states. They're not going to be abolished. And, of course, that's the fear that the high federalists would, if they could, reduce, as Hamilton would have liked reduce the states to mere administrative units to abolish the states. That wasn't going to happen. The point of the Constitution was to preserve the states so that the Republican experiments could continue there as well as on the larger scale of the extended republic, an expanding union of free states. This is the broader context. Yes, uh, the, of course, the protections of free speech were supposed to be against, uh, as Akil well knows, the Bill of Rights was going to protect the states against an overarching federal government. And it's in this context, this is not an apology for Jefferson. What I want to say, though, is that for him, the all-important thing, more important than slavery, more important than free speech, was to sustain that union. Akil, uh, Jefferson's views on states' rights versus national power emerged not only in the debate over the Alien and Sedition Act, but also in his crucial debates with Alexander Hamilton uh, in the Washington administration over funding and assumption, over the National Bank, and in his report on manufacturers. And in all of these uh, debates, Jefferson embraced a position of strict construction versus broad and flexible construction of the Constitution. Tell us about Jefferson's constitutional vision of, of, of strict 
uh, construction and states' rights and why it has led you to break up with them? Let me take two or three uh, components of that. So first you mention the bank. Jefferson says the bank is unconstitutional. Um, and he urges m- the bank bill, um, uh, Washington to veto the bank bill. Um, Hamilton, who's come up with the bank plan, writes an opposing memo to Washington saying the bank is perfectly valid. Um, we need it for national defense. Banks are really useful for national defense. Britain won the war against France, we call it in America the the French and Indian War, the world calls it the Seven Years' War, in part because um, Britain had a better financial structure. Um, uh, uh, France is three times as big, but Britain is able to raise more money and credit because of its banks. Washington signs the bill into law, and he was right to do so. Um, And eventually, it's not just that John Marshall in McCulloch versus Maryland sides with Hamilton and Washington but the Supreme Court unanimously does so. And this is a court that has on it people that Jefferson has put on the court and people that his ally James Madison have put on the court. The majority of the courts is basically Madison and Jefferson appointees, and they laugh this idea out of court, so to speak, because it's it's a silly thought. And Madison himself flip-flops. It's like Emily Latella, never mind. As president, he signs a bank bill into law. And Part of the reason he does is because when you didn't have a bank, he allowed the first bank to lapse, and there was another war with Britain, a second war of independence, and the Brits burned the capital to the ground. And then Madison and Jefferson begin to realize, oh, actually banks are useful to win wars. Hamilton and Washington weren't hallucinating. Jefferson actually does not understand banks. He doesn't. He doesn't understand a modern um, finance. Hamilton does. Washington does. So that yeah, in, put aside all this stuff that you've heard about how Jefferson's a genius in all these ways. He had certain, for all his democratic tendencies, aristocratic virtues. Oh, he knows poetry. Oh, he knows art. Oh, he knows music. Oh, he's a great architect. Only problem is actually, if you want to um, run a country, you need to understand banks and armies and war and, and finance and international trade. And he actually doesn't understand these things. He thinks the banks are kind of Ponzi schemes, which they're not quite. Um, um, so, so that's Jefferson on the bank. Washington rejected him. Marshall rejected him. Unanimous Supreme Court rejected him. His pally, um, his little protege wingman, Madison, actually flips some flops in his presence, signs the bank bill into law. Now, my bigger objection on states' rights, and, 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 and Madison says, oh, you can't have a carriage tax, and, and, eventually, and the Supreme Court says unanimously, yes, you can have a carriage tax. You need taxes for armies, and you need armies to, to prevent being reconquered by the Brits. But my biggest objection is that he does play footsie with the secession idea. He doesn't completely repudiate that, um, and, um, and that's going to be important later on in American history. Peter, what is your evaluation of Jefferson's uh, legacy on questions of strict construction, states' rights versus national power? And tell us about the footsie that he played with secession and and how it was embraced by uh, Calhoun and by the more radical Southern secessionists and uh, how how this plays into his legacy. Well, that's a great question, Jeff. And I think the best way to think about Jefferson and his legacy is, is in two ways. First, Akhil is emphasizing the centrality of states. We're talking about states' rights. I'm not going to argue with that. And I've explained why I think that's so important in Jefferson's scheme. But Jefferson, in his conception of federalism, and I mean with a small f, uh, has an idea or a vision or a hope of nested jurisdictions which strengthen each other and the main, what uh, Jefferson is thinking about, what is, what, and the legacy I think he leaves us as well, is a conception that embraces federalism uh, in which uh, the American people uh, then achieve their uh, greatest strength and possibility and flourishing peace and prosperity. This notion of a people, I think, is critical for Jefferson, and it's something that I think we owe to him. 
Uh, and there's a downside to this idea of a people because it is defined in terms that we find reprehensible and exclusive, exclusionary. Yet the, the idea of democracy as unleashing and containing the power of the people and pursuing the good of the whole, that idea of a distinct American people as opposed to any other people it's a very powerful one, and it's the reason why we make such a big deal about the 4th of July and the Declaration. Uh, that people embraces the states in which they live, the counties, the towns, all the way down in Jefferson's scheme to the farms and plantations, the households, all the way up to the Union as a whole. This is a system, of course, much of our history, of constitutional history, as Akhil knows and has brilliantly written about, is about the strains and tensions within that federal constitutional framework. How difficult it is to maintain union in diversity. We talk about a different sort of diversity now, but the idea of self-government, of local self-government, of empowered people participating Jefferson has been uh, the icon of strong Democrats uh, throughout our history, and not only in the U.S. and around the world, by endorsing and supporting participation at the local level. What does that mean? Well, uh, I have mixed feelings about Jefferson. I think everybody should have mixed feelings about Jefferson. If you take that notion of federalism all the way down to the bottom, you're imagining that each household is a like a republic itself, a little republic. But we're, what we're talking about, when we talk about those little republics, we're talking about the sovereignty of masters in their households. We're talking about the sovereignty of the slave owner, the slave master over his enslaved people. These are the tragedies that I think are built into the very notion of a people rallying together against enemies at home and abroad. The American people, well, yes, white. American people, because Jefferson saw enslaved people as a captive nation, an internal enemy that represented an existential security threat if that people were not removed, something like a cancer. Say, this is horrible. Jefferson's solution to the slavery problem is deportation, or what he would call expatriation, moving enslaved people to freedom somewhere else. This is, the, this is the, the dark side of the notion of a mobilized people winning their independence at the expense of defining themselves against their British, the mother country, but also defining themselves against the enslaved people who had assured their prosperity. That's the dark side of Jefferson, just as federalism has a dark side Democracy is a problem. It's a challenge. And historically, we can see what those challenges are, looking at how it played out in the U.S. So on the one hand, we owe to Jefferson a robust conception of the people and the power of the people. That is, sovereignty does inhere in the people. Jefferson had this notion, we will get better. Morality will will emerge from Republican self-government. That's not true. But what a thing to imagine, what a thing to hope for. Are we good enough to be a democracy? Well, the United States in 1776, 1789, whatever time you pick, it's it's a mixed question. It's there we can admire the idea of citizen equality. We can admire the idea of a participatory citizen, the power of the people. But toward what end? We can see that in the revolution, the context of making war to achieve independence, America defines itself against its enemies at home and abroad. Federalism, we say states' rights, still has that onus of segregation, of slavery, of supporting the tyranny of local majorities. Yet that idea of an empowered, mobilized, active people is still an inspiring one. We can see how the notion of a people or a nation can be a horrible, destructive thing, war-making, 
an empire of slavery. Yet we can also see in that idea a vision of human flourishing, of peace and prosperity. I think that's the legacy of Jefferson is problems, problems that we still face and we can't wish them away by making believe, by expunging Jefferson, by divorcing him. No, no, don't do that because you're going to be divorcing yourselves. This is part of the fabric of who we are. And that's what Jefferson's legacy is in so many ways to represent what's the best and what's the worst about our history. Akil, tell us about Jefferson and democracy. Peter has identified his devotion to local self-government and his faith in the people as the strongest point in his legacy. When Franklin Roosevelt read a book by Claude Bowers about Jefferson versus Hamilton in uh, the 1920s, he said at last, a defense of democracy against Hamiltonian aristocracy, and he gave Bowers a slot speaking to the Democratic Commission and presented himself as a new Jefferson, the improbable faith in activist government. Tell us about precisely what Jefferson's vision of democracy was, what the limits were on it, and whether his faith in democracy gives you pause as you decide to break up with him. So Jefferson believed, as Peter rightly said, in uh, the common man, and that was gendered. He actually didn't believe quite uh, that women should be participants in politics. He, he thought that the tender breasts of women, this is a, a quote, you know, are not fit for um, the hurly-burly of, of political uh, contestation. So common man was his idea. It's going to be the center of Andrew Jackson's vision. Peter told us one thing that it is, it's common white man. And so Jefferson is a great theorist and poet, architect, dreamer of democracy. Democracy is about the demos, the people. Um, but there are a couple of issues, okay? So who isn't part of the people? Um, so women are not politically quite part of the people. Neither are blacks. They're the, um, at least slaves. They're the enemy within and, and democracies can be that, you know, you're either in the circle or, or not who gives us democracy. It's the Greeks it, and the word, uh, from, um, demos kratia is to rule by the demos. And the Greeks actually thought the people who, um, who weren't, Greek were, they had a word for it. They called them barbarians because to the Greek ear, if you didn't um, speak Greek, that you're, it sounded as if you were saying bar, bar, bar. Um, so, um, the, and this is what Peter said. There's a downside. Democracy is a beautiful thing. that There can be a downside who's excluded from the democratic circle demographically, okay, Common man, yes. So for, for, for Jefferson, he didn't care that much about property qualifications and, and good for him. And even literacy tests, he would say, you know, give people the vote and they'll, they'll learn how to use it. So that's all admirable. Oh, and he did have a commitment to education, um, which um, is admirable. And, and he wanted them to serve on juries and they'd learn how to do democracy. But who's in the demos, okay? Maybe um, the common man, and, and regardless of property qualifications or something or educational uh, attainment, um, yeoman farmers um, are celebrated, but not women and not other races, or at least um, blacks and, and definitely not slaves who are perceived as enemies within. So that's one problem of how you define democracy. And then the second one, which we've already alluded to, is over what geographic domain. Jefferson tended to be, at the end of the day, yes, he believed in a kind of um, states' rights, but even localism and, and, and uh, neighborhoods and government that um, is closest to, to your neighborhood is, is, is the best of all, if, if possible, what Europeans call subsidiarity. But bottom line, he believed ultimately in sovereign states. He was a declaration of independence person, and he thought the relevant unit for the, of the demos was Virginia, ultimately. That's why he plays footsie with secession. He's a declaration person, and here's the key payoff line of the declaration, not just all men are created equal, um, but that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, with an S, plural. He missed the American Constitution, where... 13, um, and, and the, the declaration actually is 13 states 
um, unitedly together, um, allying in, in effect and jointly declaring their independence of Britain, but they're, they're 13 different entities um, at the end of the day. And they're allied later in a confederation, a league, a treaty like NATO, like the EU. Um, and that's Jefferson's vision to his dying day. He left in the service of America, went off to France um, uh, as a diplomat and missed the constitution which isn't just a text, but a deed, a constituting, it created an indissoluble, indivisible union. That's what Hamilton understood. That's what Washington absolutely understood. That's what Lincoln would understand. Jefferson missed all of that. And, you know, when he comes back, he's a little bit of a Rip Van Winkle. Lynn Miranda captures this on what did I miss, you know, in his Hamilton musical. And he missed the Constitution. He missed this moment of um, uh, one nation indivisible. So democracy doesn't self-define the geographic boundary and the demographic contours. And on both of those, actually, I think Jefferson's vision can be faulted. That said, Peter and I agree, he is a great visionary uh, and, and dreamer of democracy. Thank you very much for that. Well, it's time for closing thoughts in this great discussion. And both of you have argued that Jefferson's vision, rooted in states' rights, strict constructionism, and a devotion to democracy, is uh, less appealing than the alternative, usually embodied in the thought of Hamilton, who stood for national power, broad construction, and republicanism. Uh, Peter, uh, if you're breaking up with Jefferson, do you embrace Hamilton or not? Well, Jeff, I'm not breaking up with anybody. <laughs> I'm not making making up to anybody either. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to learn from all of the founders and a lot to learn from the problems of the founding. But I think we need to see that those problems in proper historical context and understand better what Actors were capable of understanding, seeing, and envisioning. And Jefferson certainly thought, and I maybe it would depart from Akil in this, that the Declaration of Independence itself was not a declaration on behalf of state sovereignty. It was, as he said, I'm quoting him, the, the fundamental act of union of these states. They came together to declare, and that people existed, and then it drafted a confederation, a, the first effort at a continental constitution, and then a more perfect union. Jefferson had mixed feelings about that more perfect union at first, as Akil knows, but of course became part of the new constitutional government. The people had a constitution. The people came first. And if the people could not sustain their union, if they fell, the union fell apart and Americans made war on each other, that would be the great failure of the whole idea of Republican self-government. Could these republics, these state republics, live peacefully together? One last thought about sovereignty, to understand the importance of the idea of sovereignty, is sovereignty is what Parliament sought to exercise over the American colonies, and that would be a total control. In the end, uh, it had to be controlled by coercion, martial law, to occupy those. That's what sovereignty meant. Is it possible to create a regime which for purposes of collective security would have sovereign powers, and Jefferson thought so, while retaining the autonomy of state jurisdictions so that they could do the things that only local governments could do. And states did a lot of the hard work of governance in the early period, all the early internal improvements uh, the development of novel forms of uh, administration and rule that was happening on the state level. Don't discount that. The states didn't disappear. Slavery, of course, destroyed that union. That's our tragic story. And it's a union that had to be destroyed. The Declaration, the American Revolution, I agree with Akil, was not a revolution for slavery. 
that wasn't the original intention, but that's what it was in fact. It created the context within which slavery would flourish. That's the tragic thing. And and anti-slavery people appreciated that, understood that. That was the great dilemma, the American dilemma, as Gunnar Myrdal called it. Many thanks for that. Akil, the last word is to you. If you are breaking up with Jefferson, do you want to get together with Hamilton or not? So we call them founding fathers, and I want to take that seriously. So there's not just one, there's a group. By convention, by acclamation, we tend to think of six preeminently um, o- over all others. George, The first four presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison, plus Hamilton and Franklin. Now, yes, in some ways I'm impelled to a separation from Jefferson in part because they broke up with each other. And this is something that I learned over the course of my research. Um, George Washington, at the end of his life, absolutely broke up with Jefferson. He refused to have any dealings with him whatsoever in his last two years, not a single letter to or from Jefferson, and he's exchanging all sorts of letters with someone who was loyal to him, Hamilton. So partly, you know, I have to choose in part because Washington broke up with Jefferson. And if I stick with Jefferson, what does that say about Washington? Oh, it's a little complicated. Now, why did Washington break up? And this is all about fathers. I'm going to come back to fathers two or three times here. Washington broke up because Washington was the father of the country and he was a father figure to all and Jefferson lied to him. And actually, Jefferson lied to others. Jefferson lied to himself. He let himself off the hook too easily and that's a character flaw. But when you lie to Washington, oh, you lose me. And I didn't know that 30 years ago and I do know that today. So let's take another aspect of fathers. What does he lie about? He lies about fatherhood. On his ob- obelisk, he says he's father of the University of Virginia, but he doesn't tell us he's father of the Hemings children whom he enslaves. He's, he's enslaving his own children. Forget about his relationship to Sally. You know, that can be you know, complicated in all sorts of ways. She's the half-sister of his dead wife, and, and who knows what that was all about. But enslaving your own children and not telling the world that they are your own children, lying about that, that's not good. That's father. These are founding fathers. So can I, can I stick with him with that? And then finally, on the Civil War, let's be absolutely clear here. His grandchildren, his grandsons, and his grandnephews take up arms against a duly elected government. They're getting that from um, Jefferson himself, from their grandfather and, 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 and great uncle, okay? Because he's bad on the secession issue. He plays footsie with it. He is not like Hamilton and Washington, who are utter continentalists, not like Lincoln and Webster, who are other indivisible folks. He's not so great on that. And that's why, literally, his grandchildren are taking up arms against a duly elected government, against uh, Lincoln's government. Um, and shame on them. And And They're getting that in part from Jefferson, and we need to be honest about this. Akhil Amar and Peter Anif for a clear-eyed, bracing, and illuminating discussion of whether or not to break up with Thomas Jefferson. Thank you so much. Today's episode was produced by Lana Ulrich, Bill Pollack, and Samson Masashari. It was engineered by Bill Pollack. Research was provided by Yara Durese, Anna Ulrich, Samson Mastashari, Thomas Vallejo, Connor Rust, and Rosemary Lee. Please recommend the show to friends, colleagues, or anyone anywhere who's eager for a weekly dose of constitutional debate. Sign up for the newsletter at constitutioncenter.org forward slash connect. And always remember that the National Constitution Center is a private nonprofit. We rely on the generosity, the passion, the engagement of people from across the country and around the world who are inspired by our nonpartisan mission of constitutional education and debate. Support the mission by becoming a member at constitutioncenter.org forward slash membership or give a donation of any amount to support our work, including the podcast, at constitutioncenter.org forward slash donate. On behalf of the National Constitution Center, I'm Jeffrey Rosen.